Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk Farm to Fork, the post-harvest podcast that interviews people of interest across the food supply chain. Today on our show, I'm joined by Kyle Cobb from Advanced Farm, who I'll be talking to about how their robotic harvesting technology is helping reduce bruising and fruit damage while increasing yields. So with no further delays, let's get started. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Before we get into the podcast, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, and maybe just a little fun fact. Sure thing. Yeah, my name is Kyle Cobb. I'm the co-founder and president of Advanced Farm Technologies based in Davis, California. I'll talk quite a bit about our story here in a minute, but to my fun fact, my son was born just a few hundred feet from where I met his mom, my wife. Wow. Wow. And whereabouts was that? That was at UCLA Hospital, just around the corner from where my wife and I met at UCLA as undergrads at our first campus job. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So what was the time difference between meeting your wife and and having your child? Okay, so we met in 2003 and he was born in 2012. So nine, nine years and three or four cities in between, back right where we started. Wow, that's so crazy how that happens. Totally, totally. That's awesome. Well... Before we get bogged down on, on <laughs> serendipity, <laughs> let's talk farm to fork. Yeah. So continuing on from you telling us what you do, would you mind telling us a little bit more about the history of Advanced Farm and how your innovative technology works? Sure. Uh, Advanced Farm was started by me and three friends that actually have quite a long history together. I went to high school with our co-founder and CEO, Mark Grossman up here in Northern California. And then he went to university with our other two founders who are together are three very bright engineers. And I compliment them on the business side with a background in finance and marketing. And we actually started a business together coming out of school as undergrads back in 2011, a business called Greenbotics, where we did robotic solar panel cleaning. Mm -hmm. As the solar industry was growing and booming, they were finding that as you build projects in the desert, they get soiled and there isn't rain for months on end. So we Hmm. needed to come up with a low water, low labor solution to clean those panels. So we built that business out of a barn in Davis using our own money for a few years. Uh, And then we ended up selling that company to one of our customers called SunPower. And we worked at SunPower for a few years, deploying robots all over the world to their power plants. And doing that also became really inspired by what was around us. And Davis is a big ag town, and we have a lot of friends who are farmers. And as you talk to a farmer, particularly here in California, the theme of labor shortages and the expense of labor continues to come up. And that really Mm. inspired us. And we decided to take the skills that we had in robotics and apply them to a new industry here, farming. And now what we like to say is we're building a 21st century farm equipment company centered around automation and robotics. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the labor shortage problem is is no different over here in Australia as well. We're in desperate need of some of that tech. But I see that Advanced Farm has been shifting its focus from strawberry harvesting to apple harvesting. Does this look like a complete overhaul of your technology's existing compounds, or is it more of a lateral tweak and adjustment with what you've encountered with strawberries? Great question, and it's one we get often. And to your point, the labor shortage that we see here in California in strawberries, where it is maybe one of the hardest jobs that a human can do and certainly one of the most expensive for a grower to pay for, that's not just the same for strawberries. It's a universal problem that we see in agriculture across crops, Mm. across regions. And I think apples is another really good example of that. And in fact, tree fruit in general is also very hard and expensive to harvest. And we've been making progress in strawberry harvesting for a few years. And I've always been asked, hey, how does this apply to other applications, other crops? And one of the benefits that we have relative to some of the others working on this problem is that we have developed a lot of the technology from the ground up. So we're not using much off the shelf. We have our own drive system, our own robotic arm, gripper, stereo camera, all designed from scratch. And in the case of moving to tree fruit harvesting, What we've been able to do, fortunately, is actually repurpose a lot of those components directly. So taking the same engine block, the same drive system, a lot of the same software and algorithms for detecting ripe fruit, how to pick it, 
and even the same robotic arms just turned sideways. <laughs> yeah. And now we're uh, we're taking that same platform to tree fruit and we expect to see similar success to what we've seen in strawberries. Yeah, that's fantastic. So then what's been the biggest challenge your team have encountered so far with your innovative products? I think if you were to ask me that question at different times, uh, you would hear different answers just based on you know, how mm -hmm. challenging this problem is and, and how it seems to change early on. I think it was really around picking fruit without causing damage to the fruit or the plant. As we grew, it was finding ways to go faster. And now I'd say the biggest problem that we've started to see is, or that we're maybe I'd say the next step change that we expect to see as a company is, is just improvements in reliability. Mm -hmm. We've picked millions of strawberries. And we know that we can pick them fast and cheap. But now the question is, can we do it at scale as we grow from what we currently have, 16 machines out in the field to hundreds of machines? Yeah. And I think that's going to be the next real challenge that we face. Yeah, totally. You mentioned before that some of the alternatives are using off-the-shelf components. Is there anything else that you would say that separates your technology from other harvesting alternatives? I think from a philosophical design point of view, that actually is a really big differentiator. I think it's it's tempting to try to use a tractor and attach a standard off-the-shelf robot behind the tractor and think that with some software and some vision system integrated that you're off to the races. But what yeah. you'll find pretty quickly is that for problems that have never been solved before, you actually need new solutions, it turns out. And so that's why we boldly chose to redesign a lot of the subcomponents. And at the time of doing it, it was, I'd say, a really hard decision to make because, again, it's not the easy route. But in retrospect, now that we're, we're past a lot of that development, it's proven to be the right decision because we control our own destiny in a way from a technical point of view. Yeah. I think the other thing that really separates us is we are very practical and very focused on being in the field. We expect that everyone from a software engineer to you know a business person is in the field regularly or frequently working through problems in the field because it's so tempting again to sit in a nice comfortable environment and solve problems but often we find that <laughs> yeah. if you do that for too long you start solving the wrong problems instead mm. of being mm -hmm. in front of customers and demonstrating that you care about what they're actually going through and that you're working hard and long hours to uh, to get to a solution faster. Yeah, absolutely. I see that Advanced Farm has collaborated with UC Davis's strawberry breeding program. Would you mind speaking more about what entails that program and what field data you hope to collect? We're very fortunate to be here in Davis, which in many ways is the center of the farming universe. Totally. Certainly from a research point yeah. of view, UC Davis is a leader across many crop categories. And to our delight, uh, UC Davis strawberry breeding program is also the world leader. And so if you look at a lot of the other examples of crops that have mechanized successfully, you see that genetics has played a part in that. Uh, and we expect the same to be true in strawberries where over time, breeders will start to release what we call robot ready varieties that have characteristics that we like. And so as part of that partnership, we've worked with UC Davis to pull forward some of the early cultivars in their breeding program that have some of those characteristics. And we follow them over the course of the season, see how we perform, make sure that they also have the other qualities such as yield that are important to growers. And the hope is that if we continue to do this collaboration, that we will see this convergence between positive genetics and, you know, advancements in robotics that lead to an autonomous harvest solution sooner. Yeah, wow. That's exciting. So then what's the biggest revelation you've uncovered while working within the ag tech industry? For us, I think it's actually how clever growers are and how, how good of problem solvers they are. Mm. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, it's, it's funny to see the ways that growers tackle problems today yeah. with relatively limited resources. And oftentimes we find that growers are not technologists, but uh, they found some other equally uh, ingenious solution to a problem that they're facing. And so I think for us, that, that also means that they're very excited uh, when we are focusing on their problems. And, you know, we see a lot mm -hmm. of support from growers who are really just thankful and grateful to have the attention of, yeah. of people with, you know, really high talent in robotics to come to the field and try to solve a new set of problems for them. 
Yeah, absolutely. So then from where you stand, what would you identify as being one of the biggest pain points in the food industry? Certainly for us, the easiest answer is labor. You know, it's it's a really pervasive challenge. And I think not only from a cost point of view, but I think as a society, we we owe it to the workers who are in, frankly, some of the toughest conditions you can imagine to doing some of the hardest jobs that you can do to provide better alternatives to that work. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, we keep that as a core tenet to what motivates us. And I think we have to come up with something more sustainable, especially on the harvest side, in order mm. for us to continue to have the diversity in our diets and the options that we want for this aisle. Definitely. Definitely. So has the COVID pandemic, for better or worse, had any effect on your day to day operations? We've been very fortunate to see relatively small amounts of disruption during COVID. Mm. Very early on, mm. the California government deemed agriculture as an essential industry. And frankly, what that meant is that we didn't stop. And in some cases, we even tried to accelerate to be there for our growers in ways that we couldn't be before. That's great. And so for us, it meant that we were able to make quite a bit of progress by continuing our work in the field. We've actually grown from about 12 people to what we are now 60 people from the start of 2020 into the middle of 2022, let's say. So we're, again, very fortunate to not have been as impacted. And in some ways, you could say that it made investors and growers even more conscious of the challenges that can come up beyond just the day-to-day -day challenges. Yeah, great. And also developing your own components, would that have been affected by the supply chain at all? Or was it actually to your benefit? No, we are seeing supply chain challenges like everyone. Mm. I think we have tried to mitigate those in the same ways that everyone else has, you know, buying early, finding really reliable suppliers yeah. that we can work closely with. But I'm really hopeful that we're getting past it and it hasn't stopped us or slowed us down much. Mm. But I think if it yeah. persists for, you know, another couple of years, then certainly everyone will be impacted. Definitely. Definitely. So when it comes to food loss and sustainable farming, what's the biggest area your team are curious about and why? One of the insights that we try to convey to others is that the entire fresh produce supply chain is designed around the human worker and in most cases, the harvest worker. And what that mm. means is that growers are asking that worker to move quickly through the field, make decisions very quickly. And oftentimes that results in sacrifices that can lead to food loss. Just to give you one example, strawberries are picked by hand in the field. They're picked off the plant mm. right into a clamshell. And then that clamshell is never opened again until it gets to a consumer's shelf. And yep. that means that any berry that wasn't quite good enough to go in that clamshell, but maybe didn't really have anything wrong with it, goes to a juice line that is turned into juice. Yep we see an opportunity to automate also the post-harvest portion of strawberries where we can disrupt a little bit of that process where it's not just one touch in the field, but it's it's a sorting and packing process after harvest that can yeah. help create new markets for consumers, lower food waste, and also provide more profitability to a grower. And you can see that with our autonomous strawberry pack line product. That's exciting. So continuing on this thought, is there a particular group or innovation within the industry that you're excitedly keeping a watchful eye on? Yeah, I think part of it's that I'm not a scientist and so I get wowed easily by scientific innovations. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, one, of the, one of the areas in farming that I think is so cool to watch is the advances in genetics. And there's a company that's actually close to us in Davis or the Davis area called Interplant mm -hmm. that has a special way of modifying genetics of certain types of plants to show markers for different things that are happening in your field. So let's say there's a disease that's impacting some of the plants or a uh, water shortage of part of the part of the ranch. That's just one company I think that's playing in the genetic space that uh, mm. I, that I, I admit I don't fully understand the implementation, but I'm just really impressed by the ability to manipulate biology in a way that can really change an industry like agriculture. Yeah, that's crazy. I love that. So what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career in developing autonomous harvesting tech? You know, I think the importance of good partners is understated. 
good partners, not only on the, you know, co-founding side, I've, I've been very fortunate to have those naturally, but I think also good investment partners have helped us mm -hmm. a long way down the road. And, and frankly, good grower partners. We we're very fortunate to have two companies, Yamaha and Kubota, really traditional technology companies based in Japan that have mm -hmm. built businesses over a generation or two that understand what it's like to start with nothing in high technology and build a reliable global business and that sort of share our vision and what is possible in agriculture and in robotics, frankly. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's um, not something that every startup is fortunate enough to have. And I'd say equally on the grower side, uh, it's very important to filter a early grower partner to those that are really keen to adopt the technology who are open-minded about making changes, but who are also willing to devote resources to, to our success. So I think those things I'd say in some way happen naturally for us, but, uh, I'm really glad that they did. And, and I, I think I would encourage others who are starting to find partners that really conform to their own timelines, their own philosophies and kind of working styles. Yeah, no, definitely. So. Kyle, we are coming to a close, but before we do, I just wanted to ask, what is the major point you really want the listeners to take away from this episode? I think the major point is that a couple of things, actually. First, we should be very grateful for all the hard work that goes into the diversity of the fresh produce that we have available at our fingertips all over the world. It's amazing the level of effort from the growers, from the workers, you know, from the breeders, mm -hmm and hopefully now from the uh, mechanical harvesting groups out there working that get yeah. that produce to the store. And I think the, the second thing is that we are entering into a really interesting and I'd say transformational point in agriculture that will be really fun to watch over the next decade or two. And I'm just really excited for what the future holds and, and anyone who's considering starting a business in this space or working in this space I highly encourage you to do so because the challenges are plentiful, but I'd say the reward mm -hmm. is also quite large, both from a personal and a professional point of view. And they're just really wonderful people to work with in this industry. And and I'm, I'm excited to see what's next. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm, I'm really excited to see what the future holds. But unfortunately, this episode is coming to an end. So that's all for today's episode of Let's Talk Farm to Fork. Thanks for listening. And thank you, Kyle, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. If you'd like to know more about Kyle and Advanced Farm, check out the link in the description of the episode. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast so that you never miss an episode. And don't forget to leave a review and share with your friends. Until next time, you've been listening to Let's Talk Farm to Fork, a post-harvest podcast. Mm -hmm.